Today, I'm gonna to be sharing the second chapter of the Octane Module Development Series related to components and routing. But before we dive in straight into the source code, I'm going to cover a few high level concepts with you, um, which will make a lot of these uh, additional information make a lot more sense. Dynamic page routing is a concept that is part of Octane, which is directly tied to the multi-tenancy aspect of the framework. Um, basically, you can have many different sites that are part of an Octane installation. The sites can be in their own database or they can be in a shared database. Um, but regardless, um, the way that the Octane framework processes them is it looks at the URL um, and it basically parses out the constituent parts. So in this particular case, the www.site.com is the domain name and it will use, it will basically look up that domain name in the alias table and try to find a match. If it finds a match, then it takes the next component of the URL, which is the page path. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that a page path can be various levels in hierarchy. Um, and it does a lookup on the full page path to find a match for that particular site. And so that's basically how dynamic page routing works. So you can have you know, as many different sites as you want that is part of an Octane installation. And for each of those sites, you can have as many pages as you want as well. Now we'll shift gears into the modular component routing because this is where it uh, touches base on the software development aspects of building modules. So again, we're gonna start with the sort of the same base URL, which is www.site.com slash home, which is our, our page route. And then we'll notice that we have a few extra segments that are part of the URL in this case. Um, the first segment, uh, which is the number one, corresponds to a module ID by convention. So it's going to basically find the home page, which is part of my site, and it's going to recognize that there must be a module on that home page, which has a module ID of one. And so it would do a lookup on that. And then the edit um, keyword is an action. And that action corresponds to um, a setting. Um, basically, it corresponds to a type name um, of a component. So basically, it uses the module ID and the action name to, to come up with a corresponding type name, which it then can instantiate dynamically, and it can render that component within the user interface. So that's basically how modular component routing works. Um, and we'll get into more of that as we get into the code. Before I do that, I just wanna mention a few um, important links. So octane.org is the home site for the Octane community. Um, the Octane source code is on GitHub uh, in the repo Octane slash Octane framework. And in each of the workshops that are part of this series, I'm focusing on an example module called dnf.projects and the full source code for that module is also available on GitHub. So with that, let's shift over to Visual Studio. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into Octane itself. Um, if we go and if we take a look at uh, the Octane source code, we can see it's broken up into various projects. And I'm going to go into the client project because that's where the, the front end components are managed. Um, and if we look in this project, we see that there's a modules subfolder. If we open that folder, we can see that there's an HTML text module that's here. And then if I also open the admin folder, we can see there's a whole lot more modules, which are all the administrative um, components which are part of the, the Octane admin user interface. Um, as much as possible, uh, it's, Octane was designed to basically allow you to rapidly develop applications. Um, and so it, to create a module, which we are going to focus on the, the dnf.projects example module, but before I do that, I'm just going to show you how easy it is to create a hello world style module. Um, in Octane and how it's how similar it is to basically creating components in Blazor. So in the modules folder, I'm going to right click and I'm going to add another folder and I'm going to call it test. All right. In the test folder, I'm going to add a Razor component. And by default, um, every module needs to have a component that's called index.razor. So if I name it index.razor, it's going to create my component. By default, it 
put some basic content in. I'm going to replace that with content that I've created uh, previously. I'm going to explain a little bit behind this. So we recommend when you create uh, components in Octane that you give it a uh, an explicit namespace so that you have control over the actual namespace of your module. If you do not include a namespace directive on your module component, um, Blazor is going to create a default namespace for you. Um, in this particular case, it's going to be named octane.client.modules.test. So it's going to use the basically the project name as well as the folder names to come up with the, a namespace. Uh, but if you want to be more explicit about it, you can specify your own namespace. Um, by default, when you're developing Blazor components, you would inherit from component base. Uh, in Octane, we require that you inherit from module base instead. And of course, module base inherits from component base, but it adds a lot of additional functionality, which is specific to Octane, which helps you accelerate your, your software development um, projects. And in this particular case, um, we're just going to print hello world. So with that, we're just going to save it. And that's all we need to do. So we're going to run Octane now. And what's going to happen is during startup, it's going to recognize that there is a component uh, in this test directory. Um, and it's going to treat it as if it's a new module. And I, so I don't need to do any manual registration. I don't need to do anything special for this module to work within Octane. Um, so with this, I'm going to go to uh, my private page, go to my control panel. In my common modules, I'm going to select the test module, and it did recognize it. Um, and I can go ahead and I can add an instance of that module to my page, and there it is, and there's my hello world. So, I mean, it's as simple as that for creating um, a module with components. Of course, we just created a module with a single component. And so we're going to now look at a more complicated uh, example, a more real world example. Um, so I'm going to close this now, and I'm going to go to the um, DNF projects sample project, which I created uh, in our last workshop session. And just to refresh your memory, um, I created this, this particular module by using the module creator, um, uh, which is the by far the simplest way to create a more robust um, module for Octane. So it scaffolded out all of these different projects uh, and files for me automatically. I'm going to focus in this particular workshop session on the client project, because the client project is where our components are and where we have to be concerned about routing. Um, so by default, we can see that it created the index.razor component, as well as a number of other components. Um, it also created a module info.cs file. And I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, explain that. So if I open the module info.cs file, it basically is an implementation of an interface, the iModule interface. The iModule interface basically returns a module definition object. And that object has a number of different properties that are on it. So these are the metadata that's related to this particular module. So this is where I would define things like the name of this particular module, the description, the version, as well as some very significant uh, metadata, which helps Octane figure out how to find specific classes um, to instantiate to get extra functionality. And it also it allows you to specify dependencies, which is important in when you're running uh, in Blazor WebAssembly. All right, so this is our iModule interface. This is actually an optional file, because you could tell from the Hello World example that we didn't create a module info.cs file. We, we didn't implement the iModule interface. So if you don't do that, uh, Octane will just create some default values for you related to your module based on its location and class name. But if you want to be more explicit, you can create the uh, or implement the iModule interface in your module. Now let's go over to the index.razor file. So the one thing that you're going to have to keep in mind is obviously Octane uses Blazor. So you're going to have to be familiar with the Blazor development model. Um, currently, Octane uses the, the model where both the user interface and the code is in the same file. Um, so if we scroll down, this is all of our user interface. Um, script here, all of our Razor script, and then we have an at code block, and we can see in the at code block, we have specific Blazor lifecycle methods that we are overriding. So on initialized async, uh, if we keep looking, we will see on after render async. So, I mean, a few of the Blazor lifecycle methods are being used in this particular module. So you're going to have to be familiar about Blazor. So 
when I, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to compile um, this solution. Um, and when I compile the solution, I mean, basically the, the scaffolding exercise uh, as part of the module creation template, um, set it up in such a way that it actually will copy the output of this module to the location that's needed so that when I run Octane, it will be available. So it created um, some DLLs related to my DNF projects um, project, and it's copying them over to my bin folder for in my Octane instance. So uh, if I actually go back to my Octane framework and I run it, it's going to automatically recognize that the DNF projects um, module is available. If I go to my page, which is just a blank page, and again, I go to my control panel, uh, my common modules, I'm gonna see that I have something called a project now, which is the, what the, the module I just created. And if I add it to the page, I can see that um, it actually rendered the module. There's basically not a whole lot to this module or as it looks right now, because I haven't added any data to it yet. Um, if I choose add project, we can see the URL up above here. We can see that the mod, again, the module ID is 31 and it's the add action method. And because it's the add action method, Behind the scenes, Octane nodes to load the add component. So if we go back and we look in our dnf.projects, we actually have a component called add.razor. So that's how it maps the route, um, which is in, in the browser, the add um, action, and it loads the specific component. So basically, by default, there's a one to one mapping between the action names that are on your route and your module components. Um, so I'm not, I, I could enter a GitHub URL here. The purpose of this module actually is to basically specify a number of different projects that are on GitHub and it will go automatically and retrieve the metrics from those projects and then show some graphs and some charts for them. So that's how we saw how the add project maps to the add component. But how does that actually work? And how do we make it simple for developers to do that? So if we go back to the dnf.projects area and we scroll down, here's our link. So Octane has a number of built-in controls which make it very simple for you to do software development. Um, we have something called an action link and there's a corresponding item called an action dialog as well. And you specify, these are actually Blazor components, um, and they have a number of different properties that are specified on them. So in this particular case, um, basically it's going to render a link um, for me. And it's going to render that link in, in the specific style that Octane needs in order to allow for multi-tenancy to work uh, and allow for the routing engine to pick it up successfully. So the action that it's going to put on the URL is add. Um, it's going to specify that only uh, users that have edit permission for this module are going to be able to view it. That's a security attribute. Um, and the text is going to say add project. And we saw that um, um, back when in the browser here. This is the add project. And so it created this, this link for me. Um, and if we look closely at the link, it's got the, you know, the, it added the my page, cap uh, um, page path to it. Um, so it's done a lot of the work for me. I don't need to manually craft uh, URLs. It, it does this for me if I use things like the action link and dialogue controls. Um, and so with that, I'm going to now explain something else when it comes to modules. So there, you can have as many different components as you want. So in this case, we have an index component, which is the default view. We have an add component, we have an edit component. Uh, we have a, a view component. So we have a, a number of different components and you can have as many as you want depending on the complexity of your module. We also have a settings component. The settings component is a special component. Uh, and if I open it up, basically it has a, a small user interface which is going to render um, a couple of options. So it wants me to enter my GitHub username and my GitHub password. And this is so that it can access the API. Um, and if I go down below, it's implemented basically a couple of methods where it, it retrieves from a settings service 
um, for this particular module, a few of the settings, so the GitHub username and password. And then if I hit up or if I hit save, it's going to save those to my settings store as well. Um, but what's special about the settings control is that it's rendered in a slightly different way than other controls. So if I go back to my user interface for a moment and I go into edit mode and I access the module actions menu, I can see this manage settings option. Uh, previously when I showed the settings, it had two tabs and we're gonna see now it has three tabs. So we've got the, the high level module settings, we've got the permissions, but now we've got a project settings which are specific to this module. Um, and it's basically taken that settings.razor component and it's rendered it here. So I've got my GitHub username and my GitHub password. So I should probably enter those right now. Um, and if I hit save, it basically uh, will save those to my settings store, which is needed for um, the scheduled job, which runs later. Um, to save some time, um, I'm going to import um, some content into this module so that we can see how it behaves. Um, so by default, um, modules have the ability to implement some import and out export, import and export capabilities. I'm gonna import some content here. So I'm gonna take this content that I've created previously and I'm gonna import it. It says that it's imported successfully. Oh, and now we actually can see some, some real uh, action here for this module, some real content. So in this case, um, if I, it, it, there's two projects that have been listed here, the Octane Framework and the DNN Platform. Um, if we go into view, we can see that uh, all of the different uh, metrics for each day have been um, tabulated in the background and it shows a, a line chart for this. Um, and in the main view, it actually shows a bar chart with the most popular um, projects. But um, so that's what the, the, the view component has a chart. The edit component allows you to edit some of the data that's related uh, if you so desire. Um, you can also delete. This particular delete button is being rendered by something called an action dialog uh, component. Um, very similar to the action link that I showed you previously, but um, with, very sim with very minimal coding, you just basically add it to your, your module component um, and it will allow you to pop up a confirmation dialog. So it asks me, are you sure you wanna delete this project? And I don't want to. Uh, and then you can wire up your events in the background. So a, a lot of really powerful um, components that are built in for you. Um, so that covers, I think, the, the settings control. Um, I should probably also mention uh, some of the other controls. So if I switch back into the Octane area, I already explained that in the modules subfolder, you've got your admin components and your HTML test, but you've also got this folder for controls. So if I open that, I can see the action link control, which is what we're using in our modules to generate the, the links with the proper routing characteristics, the action dialog, which I just showed you, and a number of other components which are available as well. For example, in the module settings, we saw permissions grid that's rendered here. We've got a paging component. So you can, if you have a whole, table of information and you want to break it down into pages, you can do that. You've got a message component, which you can use in your module to basically show a message to a user. Um, a label component, which has help text capabilities to it. A file manager, which allows you to have, to allow your users to upload files. And actually I'll show you an example of that um, in more concise form. So if I go into my admin area, I go into my site, if I scroll down here, here we go file manager. So a file manager component um, with certain properties. So I want to have only image files that are allowed to be um, uploaded through this particular mechanism. And that will, I'll show you in a moment here. Um, if I go into my admin dashboard and I'm going to go into my site settings, um, it basically renders this. And if I choose a folder, let's say I save my root folder, I have the ability to browse and upload a file if I want to. So that's basically just with that one line of code with the file manager, it takes care of all of this capability for you and uploads files to the, uh, the appropriate location for this site. So very powerful. Um, some of the other things I might wanna show you um, related to the, uh, 
scaffolded module code. So if I'm in the index area, we talked about the action link. Um, here we go, here's a pager component. Um, so by default, it'll show you know 10 rows of information um, and then add paging. Here's my action dialogue component, which is my confirmation that I showed you. Um, if we scroll down further, we have logging capability as well, um, which is very convenient to use. So if I wanna log an error, I have a very convenient logger.log error capability in my components. And this goes back to my uh, data store, which is associated to my site. So I can keep track of everything that's going on in my site. Here's the ability to add a module message. So if I want to um, provide some feedback to the user um, in the user interface, I can use the add module mes message helper method. Um, I think that the other thing that I wanted to show you is when it comes to interacting with um, JavaScript uh, and so JavaScript and style sheets, you know, are resources that you might need to use in your module. In Blazor, um, you have to use a specific way of interacting with JavaScript and that's through JavaScript interop. So I have an interop um, C-sharp class that I've registered here. If we look at that class, I can see that I have a method that I've declared in it, which is called create chart. Um, and what this create chart method is doing is it's going to call the JavaScript method behind the scenes. And so where is that JavaScript function defined? If I go into my server project and I go into my WW root folder, I can find the module.js file. So here's my create chart JavaScript function. And when you're using JavaScript interop, you have to define your functions in the specific way that, um, that Blazor expects, which I've done here. So I've got a single uh, function here called create chart and I can pass some parameters to it um, and it will render um, using chart.js. Well, and that's another aspect which I have to cover as well. So it, this module expects chart.js to be rendered uh, or to be available um, for my module on the page. And how do I do that? Well, if I go back to my, um, to my module component and I go down to the code section down below here, um, Octane makes it very easy to deal with resources. So it's got a capability that allows you to specify all of the different resources that are part of this module. So in this case, um, my module, this module component depends upon chart.js, which is loading in from a CDN. Um, and then it also, of course, depends on the module.js file that I um, mentioned previously. However, they have to be loaded in a very specific order. It needs to load chart.js chart first and then load my module.js or else it's gonna throw an error because there's dependencies between them. And I'm able to do that by defining a bundle between them and declaring them in a certain order. In addition, you can see here that um, my module also has a style sheet and I can include that here as a specific resource that my module needs as well. And where's that um, style sheet located? Well, again, if we go back down to the server project um, in the WW root folder and in a specific folder naming convention, we see that it has to be under a modules folder and it has to be under a folder that corresponds to the name of this particular module. Um, and I can see the module.css file. And so I have a number of custom styles that I've declared for this particular module. Um, and so that's how you can use style sheets and JavaScript interop in your, in your modules. Um, the other thing is if you want to use um, images as well, um, you can do that in a similar way. Um, I don't have an example of that in this particular module, um, but I did show you an example in uh, Octane how you can have the file manager component, um, which allows you to upload files. And there are helper methods as well for rendering files uh, if you want to use that as well. Um, and I think that that wraps up the explanations of components and routing that I wanted to do. Um, and next session, we'll move on to services and API.